Hello YouTube and welcome to What The Math. In today's video we're going to be using two video games to learn a little bit about history and specifically we're going to be using Armored Warfare to explore T-62 tank and its influence on history. We're also going to be using another game called Gravity Team Tactics Operation Star to talk about a specific uh, operation that where T-62 was involved and how it almost changed the world. Welcome and hopefully you enjoy the video. And let's actually start by looking at T-62 and basically comparing it to a little bit to T-55. Now the reason why uh, T-62 was necessary for the Soviet Union to develop was because by the late, late uh, 1950s, a lot of the older T-55 tanks, specifically their 100mm gun, were incapable of penetrating western tanks like Centurion or M60 tanks. And even though there was a new ammunition available for those tanks um, to kind of try to penetrate their armor, it was just not good enough and so um, Soviet Union decided to develop a completely new tank or basically upgrade a similar design but because the uh, turret that they wanted to use on the new tanks did not fit on T-55, they actually had to almost completely redesign uh, the tank from scratch. Now, unfortunately, even though T-62 was a pretty awesome tank with a lot of firepower and a really awesome uh, turret, it was actually the first tank to use what's called a smoothbore uh, cannon, meaning that it was um, it was entirely one-piece cannon that was able to fire projectile with about 25% more efficiency than other cannons. It was not really that popular with other Soviet nations, like specifically Poland, uh, Czech Republic, Romania, Ukraine, or any other uh, Soviet Union republics. We're not really that impressed by it because it was almost twice as expensive as T-55 and only had marginal um, upgrade in comparison. So basically it was really the turret that was the um, most exciting part of T-62 because it was a lot more powerful and it was able to destroy any western tank of that time. And so with the exception of the Soviet Union almost nobody used it at first but it did become more used later on after the 80s and 90s. Specifically, North Korea actually used it to develop its own series of tanks uh, that is still used today and the first one was very similar to 60, T-62 and it was called Chon Ma Ho. So even today, North Korea is probably the only nation that still actively uses uh, the derivative of this particular tank. But nevertheless, it was actually the second most produced tank uh, in the Soviet Union after T-55 and it was quite widely used in many different conflicts around the world. The most famous conflict would probably be Soviet war in Afghanistan where it was actually the main uh, primary battle tank uh, even though it was uh, already outdated by that time it was still actively used in the 80s. It was also used during Israeli war, specifically the Yom Kippur war where it was um, facing against Isra uh, Israeli patents and Centurion main battle tanks which were imported from the United States. And it was actually actively used in almost uh, every major civil war in Africa. There's quite a lot of civil wars that this tank participated in and including wars in Ethiopia, Angola, Chad, Libya and even outside of Africa in countries like Georgia. And even though it didn't really enjoy as much success as T-55, um, it's really important to take a look at how this tank actually influenced the world. So we're going to take a look at the first time it was actually used in battle today. And specifically, this is something that we call Sino-Soviet border conflict. Uh, this refers to the time when Soviet Union and China had a little fallout, actually a big fallout. And the two countries, even though both countries were actually communist and had very similar ideologies based on Karl Marx, um, they at, in late 60s had a very large essentially argument about how to proceed with communism and this uh, escalated to the point of almost complete and all-out war and uh, we're going to take a look at one of these particular battles today. Now this conflict has actually never really been officially declared a war even though it technically was sort of an undeclared military conflict. Uh, but there were some serious uh, border clashes between China and the Soviet Union that started in March of 1969 in the vicinity of uh, an island uh, in the east part of Russia or east part of China uh, near a place called uh, Usuri River. 
And this conflict continued for at least six months and at least 100 Chinese and about 60 uh, Soviet soldiers were actually killed. And the reason why this conflict even started was because of the really, really old territorial dispute bet between Soviet Union and China. Back in 19th century, uh, the Qing dynasty in China and the Tsarist Russia, uh, or where Russia was basically still an empire, um, they actually had some unofficial agreements about what's considered what in terms of uh, their own territory and some of the Chinese territory was kind of unofficially annexed by Russia and it st still is part of Russia today. Uh, but um, when China wanted to take its side back in the 60s, Moscow would not accept that. And when in 1964 Mao Zedong actually officially uh, declared that uh, uh, Russia was actually stripping China of a large territory in Siberia that actually belonged to China, uh, the Soviet premier at that time, Nikita Khrushchev, was very disappointed. He actually uh, was uh, essentially he was absolutely mad and absolutely pissed at the Chinese leader and uh, ever since then uh, the relations actually started to deteriorate. But before we continue it's really kind of important to understand why this even escalated to a kind of a battle that started uh, to occur in the 60s and it was really because of the uh, fundamental ideological difference between what China believed to be communism and what uh, Soviet Union believed to be communism. Now specifically China actually believed that it was impossible to peacefully coexist with um, with capitalist nations. Essentially, China really wanted to conquer the world and destroy the world of capitalism. Whereas USSR thought it was it was possible to coexist as long as um, they did not sort of influence each other's ideology or did not try to attack each other. So as ironic as this sounds, USSR or Soviet Union in this case was actually the peaceful communism in comparison to China. And because of this, Mao Zedong uh, referred to the Soviet communism as Marxist revision and he completely disagreed with it and decided that it was time for China to become the main communist country. China actually started to create its own network of communist uh, countries around the world that they would support and this later on led to another conflict with, with Vietnam which actually was also communist and was supported by the Soviet Union but we'll talk about this in some other videos and so essentially because of this there was a huge conflict between the two countries and at this point USA actually decided that it was maybe about the time that it came into the picture and at first it was going to offer Soviet Union a sort of a, uh, an official alliance against, against China but uh, it later realized that it was China it should approach and so uh, the relations between China and the USA started to dramatically improve at that time. And specifically the warming of relations between USA and China uh, became more apparent under Richard Nixon starting in 1971. So if it wasn't for this conflict, uh, USA and China would not even have such good relations today. And of course, none of us would even have so many products made in China if this didn't happen. But now let's actually use the game called Gravity Team Tactics to try to recreate this actual conflict conflict and uh, I'm going to show you what may have happened when uh, Soviet Union had to protect itself against Chinese aggression. And if you haven't tried this game, it's actually pretty awesome. It uh, has a lot of really, really awesome realistic battles uh, of World War II and also Cold War where you essentially play as a commander of somewhat realistic uh, units that you have to control on the map and try to uh, take over objectives and defeat your enemy. Anyway, so we're going to place a few T-62 tanks and we're also going to place a few Chinese troops here and we're going to try to recreate this battle. And during this conflict, there were actually several quite large battles. And the first one started um, near that Usuri River when Chinese uh, ambushed the Soviet troops and actually killed 59 soldiers. And uh, as a result of this, Soviet Union decided to counterattack using uh, T-62 tanks that were used for the first time in battle. And the other major battle, which is actually available in this game as well, was called the Tilikati Incident. This is when the Chinese forces tried to invade what's known today as Kazakhstan near a place called Lake Jalanashkol. And uh, this was um, a very small location. There was really nothing important there. But uh, um, the Soviet China, or sorry, the Communist China was actually claiming this location and wanted to invade it using its border patrol. And so essentially on August 13, 1969, approximately 30 Chinese soldiers crossed the border and uh, I guess you could call it invaded. They invaded the Soviet Union and occupied one of the Soviet locations. 
but because of the earlier conflict uh, near Usuri River, Soviets reacted quite, quite fast. They actually deployed a very large unit and they surrounded the Chinese and completely eliminated their patrol squadron, pretty much killing everyone. Approximately 30 Chinese soldiers were killed in this particular area and for a long time Chinese government didn't actually uh, make this uh, public because it was quite a huge embarrassment for China. But right now we're going to try to actually recreate the previous uh, incident which was the first incident that occurred, so-called Zhanbao Island incident or also known as Damansky Island incident, which is what it's known as in Russia. So this was in March of 1969. And so following the ambush and murder of 59 Soviet soldiers, Soviet Union uh, brought in artillery and they brought in their new tanks, T-62s. And this is what we're going to be doing in the game right now. We're going to be bringing T-62s to try to defeat the Chinese army. Now, uh, it's not really clear how many tanks there were, but essentially they were the main driving force of this conflict and they were the reason why um, the Soviets were able to overpower Chinese relatively quickly and essentially destroy their attacking force. However, during this attack, one of the leading tanks was hit by, um, by a shell and its tank commander was killed, so it was actually disabled. And um, the Soviets tried to retrieve this, the, the tank and try to collect uh, the, some of their dead. Um, and so the Chinese actually allowed them to retrieve the dead. But when they tried to retrieve the tank, uh, the Chinese uh, opened fire on the Soviets and they completely uh, refused to give away this trophy. And, and so what happened afterwards is that the Chinese were able to capture this destroyed tank and uh, reverse engineer some of the technologies and create their own tank afterwards. And so after studying this tank, the People Liber Liberation Army, or also known as PLA, was able to gather enough information to construct their own tank called Type 69. And if you here's a picture of uh, Type 69, it kind of looks almost exactly like a uh, like T-62 tank. And because Chinese were able to also uh, introduce some of the Western technologies into their tank and because of the warming of relations between USA and China, um, their version of uh, T-62, so so-called Type 69 tank, was quite popular around the world and they were able to sell it to countries like Iraq. Uh, so Saddam Hussein actually had a lot of these tanks. Uh, and Myanmar that used some of them because they were a little bit cheaper than, type, uh, than T-62 and because they were relatively identical in everything else. And so despite the sino soviet border conflict being relatively small in nature, it did have quite a lot of historical ramifications. For one, obviously Soviet Union and China never really became friends again, and China went its own way and developed its own communism, whereas Soviet Union fell apart and created what's known today as Russia. And the capture of the, the only T-62 lost in that battle was the reason why China was able to create its own tanks that were really successful later on and even use uh, its own military apparatus to try to sell some of these tanks to other countries. And all in all, despite this tank not being as successful as T-55, it's still a pretty awesome tank and it's still, uh, even today, is used in many countries. And one country that really likes this tank is, of course, Bulgaria. They actually have used it for a really long time, starting in uh, when they were still part of the Soviet Union. And even today, they still have a converted version of T-62 that is uh, their main battle tank uh, and part of the Bulgarian army. And even countries like Israel were able to um, recreate their own tank uh, from the captured tanks that they, uh, they captured during the war with Syria and Egypt, and they renamed them into something that's known today as Tehran 6. So the uh, Israeli Tehran 6 is actually a remodeled and recreated version of T-62. And I think that's all I wanted to mention about this tank and about the historical uh, influence that it had around the world. Thank you guys for watching and hopefully you enjoyed this video and if you did please subscribe because there's going to be more educational videos through video games coming in the future. If you have any more suggestions or if you have any comments about the tank or you know something else that's really awesome and really cool about T-62 or about the Sino-Soviet conflict or the Chinese-Soviet conflict, please post it in the comments below. Thank you for watching and game you later. Bye bye.